Good evening. I'm Derek Broman. I'm the game program manager for the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Thank you very much for tuning in on our fourth webinar regarding the latest draft chapters of the Oregon Mule Deer Management Plan update. These latest chapters cover topics related to mule deer harvest management and predation. Just like all of you listening, we here at ODFW are extremely passionate about mule deer in Oregon and are taking the mule deer plan update very seriously. This plan update is an all hands on deck approach for the agency. The content shared to date is the collaborative product of numerous wildlife biologists, wildlife researchers, and other subject matter experts with combined decades of experience and ongoing innovative research. For tonight's topics, co-authors for the draft chapters include biologists and researchers who specialize in mule deer management, carnivores, and predator-prey relationships. ODFW will continue to pull in experts to help in our goal in updating the mule deer plan. With that, let's get started with tonight's webinar. As stated earlier, we'll be discussing two chapters, harvest management and predation. We will start off with staff presentations and then finish with a live Q&A session. If you're watching live, hopefully you saw the notification to submit questions or comments in advance to increase the likelihood of being included in the live Q&A session this evening. We will be receiving questions live, but please recognize we may not get to all of the questions received, and you're welcome to submit questions afterwards as well. All questions can be submitted using the link in the YouTube video description below, the QR code, or on our Mule Deer Plan webpage. Starting out tonight is a pre-recorded presentation from Dr. Don Whitaker, the ODFW Ungulate Program Coordinator, followed by Dr. Josh Smith, ODFW's Mule Deer Coordinator. We've recorded these presentations in advance so that we might minimize any technical difficulties, but Don and Josh will be a part of the live Q&A session and as always are available for follow-up email or phone call. So Don, if you would, please proceed with your portion of the presentation. Good evening. As Derek stated, I'm Don Whitaker, Ungulate Coordinator for ODFW. I'll be discussing the harvest management process for mule deer management in Oregon. But before I dive into my topic for the evening, I want to reiterate that the purpose of these webinars is to share information and get your feedback on this revision throughout the process. It is much easier for us to address concerns and comments when they are submitted in advance and using the form on our mule deer plan website. Even if you want to submit your comments tonight during this webinar, please use this form. We have the QR code posted on the screen, and if you scan that, it'll take you directly to the comment form. After both presentations, we'll address a few of the comments we've received to date at the end of this webinar. Note that this webinar and questions is being recorded for later viewing as well. For tonight's webinar, we'll be discussing harvest management and predation. Note that the mule deer plan revision process began over well over a year ago. With this new format, we're releasing sections individually to provide more time to review each of these individual sections. We're using this webinar format to provide that information, discuss that information, and then allow for a little bit of Q&A. Our plans are for a full, complete draft later this winter of 2023-2024, with tentative adoption by the Fish and Wildlife Commission here in Oregon in early 2024. Harvest has a long history with mule deer. Early on, mule deer were important for subsistence and survival of our Native Americans, explorers, and settlers. Through time, mule deer hunting has evolved into a recreational activity, and harvest is often now the desired outcome. To no one's surprise, regulation is followed right alongside. Um, it's ranged from no regulation at all during the settlement and, and um, exploration periods to complete hunting closures and even through some very liberal unlimited seasons. We use a relatively simple basic model for harvest management or allocation. We start with information about the population of mule deer. That includes the, the number of animals, the composition of that population. From there, um, we determine an available or desired level of harvest, both by type of animal harvested and the number of animals we'd like to see harvested. This is turned into hunting seasons, which we implement using hunters. They go out, have their hunting season, and they come back and they report to us what they did, how, 
they did it, where they did it, and what they took. This feeds right back into the model as we start talking about the next round of hunting season. Establishing deer seasons is a multi-year process. The current seasons that we're currently enjoying were established over a year ago using information we collected from 18 to months to two years ago. As we're in the middle of the current seasons, we've also started developing our information and preparing seasons for next year. We use data compiled from the ongoing seasons and our winter population and composition series to get things set so we can, and those seasons for next year were established by the Fish and Wildlife Commission in September. Setting hunting seasons is an open and very public process. We provide ample opportunities for people interested in mule deer hunting and mule deer ecology and management, and just mule deer in general. Typically, the decision on a mule deer season or tag numbers and regulations are set by the Oregon Fish and Wildlife Commission. Key to the basic harvest model are goals for harvest or hunting. These are the reasons why we want or need the seasons. There are four predominant goals for hunting season in the West for mule deer. In areas managed for optimum hunting opportunities, tags are generally easy to get and hunters tend to enjoy more frequent opportunities to go mule deer hunting. Hunts with this goal tend to have high hunter numbers and younger bucks make up a high proportion of the harvest. This is an important harvest goal since the leading desire expressed by hunters when surveyed is to be able to hunt frequently with some chances of seeing and harvesting a deer. The goal of mature, mature buck hunting management is somewhat opposite to optimum opportunity. To have a high proportion of mature bucks in an area, hunter numbers must be restricted, and sometimes those restrictions are dramatic. These types of hunting opportunities are definitely harder to get. Hunters hunt much less frequently these are in these areas, but older and larger bucks tend to dominate the harvest. Desires for this type of hunting opportunity are growing, but they are still a much less provided reason for hunting than being able to hunt frequently. Population management is an important tool for wildlife managers, and this is often a goal for the harvest. Harvest can be used in situations where deer populations are too high for the landscape or population stru structure is dramatically out of, out of balance. Female harvest is the primary mechanism by which population size and structure are aligned. In some livestock and agricultural areas, conflict management may be a goal for the harvest. These situations are very similar to population management in that female harvest is our most useful tool. It is important to note here that these goals can sometimes interact and it's common for some of these hunts to have multiple goals. Beyond the goals for a hunt, there is a lot of interacting information we consider when developing a season or a hunting opportunity. Legal requirements like Oregon Revised Statutes are important. An example of that would be the wildlife policy for the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Statutes also set up many of the sideboards for our hunting seasons and they, they guide such activities as landowner preference and disabled hunting and, and such things as that. Oregon administrative rules are also a legal requirement. These are the net result of statutes and they include such things as regulations and legal weapons, importantly, uh, management objectives and uh, items like management plans, including the Oregon Mule Deer Management Plan, our Oregon administrative rule and their legal requirement. An important and obvious consideration that we have to look at is the deer population status. We're always looking at the population performance, the trend in relative number, recruitment, and the structure and number of bucks and does and fawns. Importantly, the population status should be tied to the management objectives. Hunter numbers are important. By hunter numbers, we're talking about um, whether we're going to allow unlimited hunter numbers or have some level of control, and these are linked and usually tied to the harvest goals. An example would be for mature buck harvest. Uh, we would limit the number of hunters. If we're looking at opportunity, those would be less limited. Typically, unlimited hunts are 
only allowed when the population being hunted is very high with very high productivity, or in some cases, unlimited hunts can be used where risk of being harvested is very, very low. The deer are not very vulnerable. We don't ignore public desires. In fact, we, we are trying very hard with this new process to get public information. Um, typically, most requests from hunting types would include weapons selection. Um, folks hunting with similar weapons, muzzleloader or archery, like to hunt with folks in the field with the same weapon and the same effectiveness. Season structure includes lots of things that we look at. Um, timing and length of the season affect harvest rates and harvest amounts. Um, the number. Bag limits are included in season structure, and importantly, the area that can be hunted is part of the season structure that we consider on an annual basis. As mentioned, an important legal requirement or management objectives. These were first set in Oregon by the legislature in 1981. For each WMU, a desired winter population size, postseason buck ratio, and fawn ratios for winter and spring were established. Buck ratios are used to inform primarily hunting opportunities, that allowing low postseason buck ratios results in more hunting opportunities in an area, whereas keeping a high postseason buck ratios to meet that objective, we have to typically limit our hunting opportunities. At the time management objectives were set, a seven buck per 100 doe buck ratio was felt to be the minimum to provide um, reproduction in the herds. Our current most lowest buck ratio of 12 is used to provide us a little bit of reproductive cushion in our herds or our populations. Winter and spring fawn ratios are used to index survival and recruitment, with minimums established to account for all forms of mortality, including hunting, to help us maintain a, a stable or growing population. As we've learned in previous chapters, there are a few issues with the current management objectives. We know that mule deer movements are not well aligned with the wildlife management unit boundaries and timing of movements do not align well with our data collection processes and our hunting seasons. Since 1981, we've met the MOs at a few wildlife management units at that level, but we have never met the statewide total management objectives since 1981. As we talked about in the habitat, habitat chapter and other sections, our ability to meet ex existing MOs in the future is not very realistic without significant changes to the Oregon real deer landscape. The current capacity of our landscape has declined dramatically since the mid 1990s. Oregon's harvest regulation started in 1991 when the 1901 when the legislature established the first season for deer. The first limited hunts for mule deer began in 1938, and rifle hunting in eastern Oregon, eastern Oregon wide, became controlled in 1991, and only just a couple of years ago. We included archery harvest and all other hunting seasons for mule deer as limited and you must apply and draw the tag. Hunting and harvest has followed the trend of mule deer numbers through time. That decline is, or that population has been declining and so has the hunters and so has the associated harvest. <clears throat> it's important to note that the decline in hunter numbers and, and hunter harvest is a result of ODFW action in response to those population trends. As the population has come down, we have responded by limits to hunting opportunity and harvest to keep nuclear conservation in the forefront. Importantly, one of the biggest obvious changes is the proportion of female harvest. In the, the, the days that everybody remembers in the 60s and 70s, um, females represented as high as 40 percent of the harvest. In the 1960s through 2002, that dropped down to 10 to 20 percent, and currently our female harvest is less than 10 percent of the total mule deer harvest. 
Moving into our issues and strategies for harvest management, our number one issue is that the demand for mule deer honey is, in, is increasing, but our ability to supply those opportunities has declined as populations have declined. To address this in strategy one, where our improved monitoring and modeling strategies indicate populations are responding in those areas where habitat and other actions are being implemented, we will increase the available honey opportunities. Secondly, in strategy two, these same monitoring and modeling strategies will allow us to more critically evaluate population trends relative to MOs in a manner where we can look for other areas with potential to increase hunting opportunities. Issue number two is that female harvest is extremely low now. Um, that same monitoring will allow us to critically evaluate all kinds of things. First and foremost is we have quite a number of radio collared deer still out on the landscape and have collared over 2000 since um, the early 2000s. We can go back and look and evaluate the mortality patterns in those collared deer to determine whether mortality uh, harvest which to determine whether harvest would be compensatory or additive to the ongoing mortality patterns in those herds. If mortality is determined to be compensatory and a population is considered to be at its landscape capacity, there's the opportunity to consider some limited doe harvest in those herds. Thirdly, um, our new modeling and, and evaluation methods will allow us to critically evaluate what's going on in those populations and what the viability and need for potential female, female harvest could be. There is a possible increase in the demand for mature buck hunting opportunities. Increasingly, the number of comments we receive through the commission and here at the department tend to request mature bucks but our human dimension surveys, and when we ask our hunters, the leading preference of our hunters is to hunt more frequently. Yes, they would like to see the older bucks, but the driving factors, they want to hunt more frequently rather than wait for opportunities to go real deer. To address this, we propose to increase our number and resolution of hunter surveys to better understand hunter desires in strategy one, and to more critically evaluate our trends in buck ratios and age structures of harvest in strategy two. And where everything's consistent with strategies in one and two, we can consider implementation of more mature buck hunting opportunities. We also commonly receive requests for new hunt types from small groups of like-minded hunters. But because our mule deer resource is currently limited, Demands for hunting opportunities is much higher than we can sustain. To add additional hunts for new groups, we would need to take that hunting opportunity away from someone else. Using the increased resolution and frequency of our hunter preference studies, we can evaluate where the potential for gains and losses of hunting opportunities would best be placed based on the acceptance of those that are doing the hunting. We've had management objectives in Oregon for over 40 years now, but as pointed out earlier, they have a few issues. They don't align with our known animal movements and migrations. They don't align well with our ability to collect data and monitor populations. And as pointed out earlier, they're not appropriate for the current habitat capabilities of the Oregon mule deer landscape. Our first strategy is to better track our populations using new integrated population models that are much more rigorous and much more sensitive and much more informative if we run them at the biological scale of a herd range. These models produce more realistic ranges of important population parameters to better inform our management decisions. Our second strategy is to use the information from these IPM models to establish population-based performance metrics for both the short-term and the long-term management of mule deer in Oregon. As actions are imp implemented in the herd ranges for deer, these more reliable and sensitive metrics will do a much better job of letting us know where we can go with our hunting and harvest management. These new short and long-term objectives are forthcoming in an appendix and will be presented during the next webinar. The appendix will be structured by herd range, and it's going to include background information on the herd range, the management objectives, the population information, and importantly, it's going to include a listing of potential actions that would benefit mule deer in that herd range. 
Finally, our last issue, we're including the last two strategies and management objectives. We know that our surveys uh, need to be aligned and our models need to be calibrated from the wildlife management unit to the herd range. For this, we're going to continue our periodic surveys and data collection on the populations and the composition of those called those herds to align and calibrate those models. Further, we know that our management objectives in mule deer are tied to many other processes in statute and rule. Um, so as an important strategy, we need to evaluate where those ties are and what can and should be done relative to those ties. Our last issue is harvest allocation, monitoring and biological data do not match the scale of our animal movements. Um, we know that our animals are or wintering in WMUs that they don't summer in, and that means that oftentimes our hunting seasons are not structured appropriately. So strategy one is we need to develop some new hunt areas based on animal movement and distribution, followed by strategy two, we need to change how our hunting opportunities are allocated to match those areas. It may seem formidable, but it's really not as serious as it looks. Um, in the second strategy to allocate those hunter opportunities based on new hunt areas, we're using the animal movements and winter and summer distributions to design what these hunting unit boundaries are. They may not necessarily be WMU based, but we're going to try to follow WMU boundaries wherever we can. Some units may be split, but it won't be as complicated as it sounds. If we look at the north side herd range on the left graph, which is a northern red outline, there are seven WNUs included in there. The new hunt areas potentially could be as simplified down into as few as five based on where the animals winter and summer and move to and from to. With that, I would now like to turn this webinar over to um, Dr. Josh Smith where he'll discuss issues associated with predation. If we can come out of anything tonight with, with, with regards to predation, I, I, I really will hope folks realize that the influence of predation on milder population performance is complex, and the effects of predation can vary widely depending on a multitude of factors specific to each population. And really, partly due to some of that complexity and, and other things like ultimate versus uh, proximate causes of mortality, additive and compensatory mortality. Um, it, it, it adds to that complex nature and makes these things, makes, makes predation also very controversial. And certainly from, uh, you know, just from the comments we've received related to the management plan, predation is probably number one, harvest management probably number close, close number two. Both these topics are, are can can be a little bit controversial, and also, uh, you know, with regards to predation specifically, we do have different segments of uh, the population, the human population, that is, that have different values and attitudes regarding predator prey species. And kind of as we, you know, as we think about these these interactions, um, these these can be influenced by both the, the predator and the prey species. And if we think about it, you know, from the predator side of things. Um, different predator species can have different impacts on populations based on preference for specific sex and age classes, for instance. And this this figure here, we have a uh, different different age classes of mule deer here at the top. We have neonates, and then and then followed by juveniles and adults. And these lines here kind of go showing the, the some common predator species that we have here in Oregon: black bear, bobcat, coyotes, and cougars. And in those, the kind of the size of those lines indicate the relative proportion uh, of, of mortalities that they're responsible for. And again, these are relative to each other. So you can see here for our neonate segment of the population, for example, coyotes have a, a thicker line. They do tend to have the, you know, take the, be the biggest component of, of, of taking that, that age class, the neonate section of, of our, our mule deer ponds. And when I say neonate, I talk about newborn from about zero to four months of age. And we'll get into a little bit more specifics about that here um, later on in the talk. Um, but again, we do have black bears, bobcats also take those and then, but 
Cougars do tend to be the second biggest source of mortality for that age class. And, you know, as, as these animals age and become more mobile, um, they, they do tend to become less susceptible to predation or at least all, all the predators that do not take them equally. Again, kind of bears drop off here for this, this section of the, that kind of juvenile age class, about six to 12 months. Obviously, bears do tend to hibernate during that time, so they don't tend to take. But also bears just really tend to key in on those animals during the first few weeks of life. But again, coyotes do tend to have the biggest impact on, on, on that juvenile segment of our population at six to 12 months of age. Then these, as these animals age, become adults, um, we can see here bears and bobcats, very low probability of taking them, kind of illustrated by the, the gray lines here. But here we see the, the predator responsible for the most uh, you know, mortality uh, from the predation side of things is actually cougars. So we, again, we see a flip here. Um, based on the different uh, the different age classes, and, and we do know uh, that our adult female segment of the population has the biggest impact on population performance. So that that is a key metric there. Uh, again, depending on which age class you take, uh, you can have a a, a a more or less impact on overall population performance. Um, other things like habitat use overlap. Um, can can also influence um, how how predators uh, you know that overall mortality rate and impact to, to population performance. There are other things like alternative prey availability and just kind of a classic example um, that that was illustrated you know fairly recently. This results out of uh, a large study in Idaho when um, you know when lagomorph populations or primarily your your rabbit populations were relatively low they found that coyote predation on neonate fawns was actually higher. When those lagomorph populations actually increased, they found that predation rates on neonates was actually lower. And their assessment was, you know, if, if you were going to do coyote removals and, and they were doing some coyote removals as part of this project, they actually had a bigger impact on your mule deer um, population when those lagomorph populations were lower as uh, it, it tended to offset some of that predation on, on mule deer. Bonds. <clears throat> There's also some other things like interspecific competition and interference competition between between predator species. Um, some work here in Oregon, you know, coyotes do tend to to usurp or attempt to usurp uh, cougar kills oftentimes, and they can take this. This is a great source of you know protein and and biomass for them to consume. It's a relatively easy meal, so to speak. It's already dead, um, but you know, in the same token, we did find that, you know, cougars were, were killing and, and consuming coyotes in a pretty large per percentage of the population um, when they do try to, to try to make those uh, kind of risky, risky life decisions that are choices, trade-offs. And I would just point out, you know, um, folks that haven't done so, I, I would encourage everyone to go and read, uh, read the chapters if you haven't done so already. We do go into a lot more detail on some of these concepts. But also, you know, from the the prey side of things, they can also influence um, their their overall, um, you know, uh, mortality rate as well. And one of the biggest things for sure is nutritional condition uh, of the animal. Um, we know that, for instance, animals that are, you know, in poor nutritional condition are more likely to die of malnutrition. They do become more susceptible to predation and, and disease and things like that. Um, but this also, one of the other ways it can influence them is, is through behavioral choices. If you think about deer kind of coming into the end of winter when they're, you know, most nutritionally stressed, um, they may have to forage in riskier habitats just to meet, you know, basic energetic requirements that may put them in uh, having to, again, forage in kind of these riskier environments, making them more susceptible to predation. And there's other things like body size. We kind of talked about this as 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 animals age and become bigger, they kind of become less susceptible to certain certain predator species. And, you know, for instance, uh, elk as well uh, are not usually, uh, full-grown elk is not usually susceptible to predation to, from bobcats. We just know body size does influence the predator species that can, that, that can take you. Um, there's also other things like social organization and young rearing behavior that can influence that as well. <clears throat> and, 
there's a variety of reasons for this, but predation is frequently identified as a primary source of mortality from mule deer. And because of this, it is often implicated in the declines of mule deer populations, uh, not only here in Oregon, but across other Western states. And in Oregon, we do have a full suite of predators. We've talked a little bit about most of these here um, in Oregon that do vary in the percentage of animals and, and deer that they consume um, you know, on a, on, a, on a yearly basis. Uh, we do have wolves in the state. They have made a natural recolonization, um, but just from a relative population standpoint, um, wolf numbers are relatively a lot lower uh, in in respect with with respect to just overall uh, in comparison, I should say, I guess to to black bears and cougars and and coyotes and bobcats and those sort of things. So um, tend not to be as as important, uh, but that can vary locally depending on wolf densities and stuff. But when we do think about these mortality rates and things like that, is it, it is important to tie in um, to overall survival and not just think about it in terms of the proportion of mortalities. And I'm gonna go through a, a series of slides here. Uh, we present some of these in the in the chapter, but I do wanna give a few caveats on the, on the data here. Again, I mentioned we are, I am, Presenting these as an overall mortality rate, not the proportion of mortalities. And data come from several different sources. Uh, we're going to present data for neonates, juveniles, and adults. And the data for neonates comes from a research project in Northeast Oregon from 2014 and 16 in Starkey Experimental Forest. It's part of a uh, part of a, a PhD work that was going on there. So about three years of data here. So a little bit smaller sample sizes than these other ones. The data for juveniles is based on data from 2019 to 2023. We've been calling about 50 animals per year in three different herd ranges um, since that time. So about 150 animals were calling in December, following those till the following, um, essentially June 1st, May 31st. So a six month time frame. So this would be an overwinter survival estimate of those, those mule deer juveniles. And the data for the adults spans a lot longer time frame. These come from 2005 to 2023. This includes a South Central study site. Uh, a lot of the collars that were used for the herd range analysis that we presented on earlier and up on the website as well, as well as some uh, additional monitoring efforts that have been taking place um, since, since uh, kind of wrapping up the herd range analysis. So again, a lot longer time frame and a, a lot longer, a uh, lot larger geographical area as well. <clears throat> so I would just point out, you may see some numbers here that don't jive with some estimates that you may have seen previously, um, and those are more likely to be because, again, we are presenting as an overall mortality rate, not a proportion of mortalities, and this incorporates a lot more varied data, again, both spatially and temporally. So we're using a lot of this data from across Oregon uh, and across a, a lot longer time scale. And to get the data, we did subset uh, a lot of these down um, based on known causes of mortality. So you will not see any unknown causes of mortality. We looked at animals that were, they had to be, had, had to have been investigated within four days of mortality and, and again, a known cause of mortality. And I, I will say from doing a lot of these survival studies in the past myself, one of the most difficult things to gauge is actually, you know, other forms of mortality other than predation. Predation is fairly easy to document um, from collar data, at least say, hey, this animal died of predation. The other things that are harder to get are things like malnutrition or um, starvation or, or, or freezing, you know, those other document or disease and those sort of things those things are difficult to document so just a just a caveat with that as you look at these numbers here so the first um estimates are for again that neonate um mule deer segment the youngest segment and this goes from birth to approximately um, the first four months of life and Neonate mule deer, like pretty much all other ungulates, tend to be have the highest mortality rates. This is when they are most vulnerable and have a wide array of possible predators that can take them. But what we found, again, over this three-year time period in Stargate, that's that 36% of those animals survived and 64% die. And the majority of those do occur within the, the first few days, weeks of life, for sure. And as we 
look at these and break these down by specific causes. We do see coyotes account for 19% and cougars account for 11, so about 30% total here. And um, again, these are going to be based on this mortality rate is 64%. So this number on the pie chart to the right will sum to 64%, not 100. But again, coyotes do tend to be our biggest source of mortality, excuse me, followed by cougar. Bobcat and bear each making up about 6%. We do have an additional 9% from unknown predator species and natural causes accounting for about 13%. And just for a little reference um, here and, and some, I guess, context more, there was a recent review in uh, the new mule deer management book that just came out earlier this year, the predation section um, that was written by uh, Hurley et al. 2023 and out of out of out of Idaho there found neonate survival averaged approximately 43 percent across the West and the studies they reviewed. So um, definitely from for this time frame, we're a little bit lower than uh, than those other studies um, across some of the Western states. But again, kind of within range there. As we switch gears here and look at the six to 12 month age class, we can see that 60% of those tend to survive annually and 40% of those do tend to die. Um, I guess I should say over the six month time frame, not necessarily annually. And we see, do see a similar breakdown, at least in our, for our top two. Again, coyotes accounting for the largest proportion of those mortalities at 11%, cougar at eight. We see bobcat, unknown predator um, there, bob, bobcat at 6%, unknown predator at one. Then we have natural causes accounting for 7% and vehicle collisions accounting for an additional 7%. And again, kind of referencing back to the estimates from that mule deer book, they found about 52% annual, sur or again, six month survival um, was documented in, uh, in the, the new mule deer management book from across the Western US. So we're a little bit higher than those documented there, but again, close to the, the, the range of what you would expect. As we switch gears and look at uh, adult female mortality, uh, we do see that 77% of those survive annually. And this, and this one is in fact an annual mortality rate. And uh, we, we do see a 23% overall mortality rate. And again, just to reiterate, these come from about an 18 year time period and across Eastern Oregon. So, uh, just keep that in mind. Um, these these estimates are likely to vary um, spatially, so within within different herd ranges, and uh, also temporally. So through time, some of these some of these estimates may have changed. But here's where we we see the the actual percentage of those top two kind of flip. We do see cougars account for the biggest source of mortality on our adult age class at nine percent coyotes at two percent bobcat bear and wolf each coming in at less than one percent unknown predator at two percent and just to point out again uh, you know we we've we've covered a lot of of mule deer over this time frame but not a lot in in kind of our higher wolf density areas so again uh, that wolf number is likely to vary uh, depending on wolf densities in a local area we do see a 4% die of natural causes. And kind of breaking these down, the last 6% are kind of more anthropogenic causes of mortality. We see poaching at 1%, hunting at 1%, and vehicle at 4%. And again, some of you may have seen estimates of poaching a lot higher. And again, this, this could be a lot higher locally in, in some areas. And, and this is from a lot wider subsample. And Again, kind of referencing back to that Hurley chapter again, they found about 82% annual survival from across a lot of Western states, and that did span a, a, a pretty wide time frame. Um, and we we would like to see for sure our, our adult doe survival, that that's pretty low. We do know we would like to be up in the 83 to 85% annual survival. That's kind of where we need to be to get you know population growth across across all herd ranges and we would like to see that obviously a lot higher. <clears throat> so when we think about kind of what these what these numbers mean, it is important to 
consider these in the context of additive and compensatory mortality and just think about what that means. And I kind of want to give a quick illustration. We we do use this term a lot, and I just want to give a kind of walk through what we're talking about when we use that term. Um, for instance, here, this is kind of a hypothetical population. We start out with 90 individuals at the start of the year. We go collar them. And at the end of the year, we look and we see that 30 of those animals actually died of predation, 30 died of natural causes, and 30 of those animals survived till the end of year one. So if predation was completely compensatory, if we remove predation from that population, what we'd expect to see is 30 of those animals would still survive and 60 of those would die of other causes or natural causes in this kind of, this kind of example here. In contrast, if predation is additive, we would expect to see 60 of those animals live till the end of the year and 30 of those die of natural causes. In reality, most sources of mortality, be that predation, harvest, or whatever, is likely to fall along some continuum, though. And we're likely to see something more like this, where it's partially additive or partially compensatory, however you want to frame it, and that we would see something like 45 of those animals survive and 45 of those animals die of natural causes. So that's what we're referencing when we talk about additive and compensatory mortality. But again, that is generally on a sliding scale. And, you know, I bring this up because we here in Oregon have attempted to, to look at, you know, kind of reducing at least, not maybe not removing the entire predation pressure, um, as well as other researchers in, in several other states have, have looked to try and, you know, implement some sort of study to see what happens to these populations when you remove the predation pressure or at least reduce it. And since the early 2000s, ODFW, we have implemented seven target areas, six for cougar and one for coyote to reduce predator densities in the area with the goal of increasing population performance. There have been some others to, to look at other things such as human safety concerns and, and, uh, and livestock depredation and those sort of things. But I'm, I'm really just gonna focus on the ones that we're specifically targeting uh, uh, ungulate population performance here. And you can see there's two different colors here, the kind of the yellowish color, those were more elk focused areas, um, that Wanaha, Ukiah, and Hetner units. Those were cougar target areas where the goal was to reduce cougar densities, reduce number of cougars in those wildlife management units, uh, with the expected response being we would see uh, increased cow-calf ratios in the, in the winter fall. And then we also implemented four additional target areas. Three of those were for Cougar, the Steens, Warner, and Interstate, and a coyote removal area to improve uh, that was more mule deer focused. And again, the Hepner one was the only one that had both an elk and a deer focus, uh, and a coyote and a, a Cougar implementation for the predator removal side. And we kind of got contrasting results. If we look at what we found for the elk removal sites here in the Hepner Ukiah units, we did find actually that it did improve um, cow calf ratios in the fall. We did not find any effect in the Wanaha unit, though. In contrast, um, when we look at um, all four areas that we implemented these for mule deer, um, we really found no population level metrics that indicated um, we were successful uh, in improving any of those metrics, both abundance or fond doe ratios uh, in the in the fall in those. And just a, a few caveats, we did, we weren't really able to meet target objectives in any of these areas other than maybe the, the coyote removal area um, for our, the, the target of removing the number of predators we wanted to remove on the landscape. We failed to do that in all units, not only for deer, but also for elk, but we still, you know, we were able to find some, some positive benefits to elk and not deer. And we do know that, you know, there's, there's a variety of reasons that we may not have found. I mean, some of that may have been monitoring techniques. Um, we weren't using anything more than just kind of our, our normal monitoring techniques to gauge that, but, um, there are some, you know, behavioral, uh, biological, and just life history characteristics that differ between mule deer and and elk. Uh, one of the biggest things is is uh, you know, pregnancy rates. Pregnancy rates for mule deer tend to be high, run upwards of 95 to 90 
98, 99% in most populations. Um, elk, one of the biggest determinants of whether they breed or are pregnant the, the next year is whether they recruited a fawn or a calf the following the previous year. Um, but the biggest thing that impacts mule deer population performance when it comes to nutritional quality is, is fecundity. So they're more, more likely to have more doe, more fawns when, when nutritional condition is, uh, is good on the landscape and they can have upwards of 1.7. So you can have the potential for very high growth rates and you have the potential to increase population performance, even under high predation rates. But when we, we do see kind of these lower nutritional conditions, potentially, we do get lower reproductive rates and that influences fawn survival. Um, one of the biggest determinants of whether that fawn survives through the first, that neonate age class is birth weight. That's been a, a huge de determinant. Um, similarly, one of the biggest things that influences that six month time, time frame is weight they are when they enter winter. And there was a recent study just came out, I think it was either this year or late last year from Lamb et al that documented, you know, about 35 kilograms, kind of a magic weight where if, if they don't come into that, they have a much lower chance of surviving um, over winter. And all this is influenced by maternal condition and um, conditions on the landscape. So it not only influences reproduction and fawn survival, but we know we also get lower adult survival, uh, potential for higher disease risk, higher predation rates occur. And if you think about this, you know, as, as fawns um, are born to mothers in, in poor body condition, the mother in, ends up producing less milk, has to spend more time away from that fawn feeding to meet those energetic costs, those added energetic costs of lactation. Um, fawns can, you know, make alert calls to the doe more often. Um, and anyone that's hunted coyotes or cougars and using a, a fawn in distress call knows that, you know, these predators do respond to this stuff. So it in, can increase pred predation rates on, on everyone. And ultimately, this can influence population performance. And I'm going to walk through a, a series of slides here. Um, this data is not from I, Oregon, in fact, but uh, I got this from uh, from uh, Mark Hershey there, and it works for Utah Game and Fish. He's actually working on his PhD, I think, using some of this data. But he shared this data with me, and I, I thought it was pretty interesting. And just kind of kind of walk through a couple of these things, because I think they're they're pretty informative. Um, these graphs are going to show December body fat on the x-axis, and just the, the key point here is the lower numbers, the poor, poor condition that animal is in when it comes into winter, and the higher numbers, the better condition it is. And this is just the frequency in the sample here on the y-axis, so the higher the number here, the more, more, of that, more of that sample size came in at that. So you can see most of these animals are coming in about the 7 to 7 to 10 percent body range, body fat metric um, in, in December. And again, this is just the frequency in the sample. So next, we're going to overlay this in with the animals that die of malnutrition. Again, that's this curve here. It's definitely left shifted, indicating that those animals that come into winter in poor with, with lower body fat metrics tend to have a higher probability of dying in the winter. And Again, this is the same graph here on the left. I apologize, I couldn't really manipulate these, but I, I wanted to kind of show these and in, in, to have side-by-side -side comparison. So that's the same graph we just showed. But here, we're gonna put on um, the animals that died from coyote predation. And then that's gonna be, you know, this one right here. And what you can see is this nearly identical graph here follows um, kind of our, our, our malnutrition category. And what this would tend to indicate is that, um, you know, those animals that are malnourished are more likely to die of coyote predation as well. And, and in fact, this curve was not significantly different from the malnutrition curve, but it was significantly different from the frequency in the sample. And this would tend to indicate those animals that die of, you know, coyote predation probably more likely to be added if they were more or compensatory, excuse me, they were more likely to die of malnutrition either way. And I guess just to kind of circle back, go back here to this, this one here, you will see some of these that do, we do in fact get some, some animals that die of malnutrition in relatively good body condition. We get harsh winters like they had in 
in Wyoming this past year. We had a pretty harsh winter in 16, 17. You do get animals that are in pretty good condition that still die, but again, these can be even worse if these animals, you know, were in even even lower body condition. They these these large scale die offs are likely to be even worse. Again, this is the graph with all three, the coyote malnutrition, and I'm just going to toss on the next one here. This shows um, our graph with cougar mortality. You can see this graph indicating those the cougars tend to be a little less selective. Um, there is some indication based on Kent Hershey tell me, there is some indication they are selecting for slightly lower body condition animals slightly animals slightly lower with slightly lower body fat metrics but again it's not significantly different um, from the sample so again this is telling us that perhaps cougar predation is likely to be a little more additive in this population those animals probably would have survived winter and i bring this up just to we are about to implement a, a pretty large scale mule deer research. Well, we just wrapped up our first year actually in the Murders Creek herd range, and we'll be starting a second site in the Klamath Basin herd range here um, in, in December, starting our first year of capture. Um, we are gonna be trying to address some high level research question, mainly what is the role of nutrition and habitat on mule deer survival, and what is the role of predation on mule deer survival and population growth? And Ultimately, we do hope to quantify the relative contribution of both. We are going to be collecting body condition on adult females and tying that into neonate, juvenile, and adult female survival and, and reproductive rates, so things like pregnancy rates and number of offspring. And we'll be looking at variation as well in carnivore densities, both spatially and temporally, and how that affects population performance. So we'll be looking at carnivore densities both between study sites and across years within study sites to kind of gauge how changes in predator numbers um, influence uh, overall mortality rates. And kind of to give an idea of how this might work and how this might tell us, what this might tell us at the end of this, this is a hypothetical example. Again, we've collected one year of data. So th these are, again, hypothetical. I can't stress that enough. Um, examples of what's something we might find. But if we look here, if say we get at the end of this five years and we have a population growth rate in Murders Creek of 1.03. So just for reference, anything above one on this number indicates population growth. This would suggest this population is growing at 3% annually over that five year period. Um, and we see that they're coming in in relatively good body condition. In contrast, if we go into Klamath Basin and this population growth rate is 0 0.92, meaning this population was declining at 8% annually over that five year period, and their body fat metric is 7.6%, this may indicate we have a nutritional issue in the Klamath Basin. Whereas we could also see a hypothetical example for a predation issue. <clears throat> say we have those kind of same body scores in 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 Murders Creek, but see a, a 0 0.95 indicating that population is declining at 5% annually. Klamath Basin at 1.01 and they come in at 10.2% body fat, both in relatively decent body condition coming into winter, but this population does not tend to be growing. Well, this could indicate that we actually do in fact have a predation problem in that herd range. And I kind of threw this in, this was, Kind of an example that was from um, that Utah actually found. They've been they've been collecting these body score metrics on about seven or eight different of their different herd ranges, but they kind of found a sort of similar condition in one of theirs. They found two herd ranges that were both uh, equally performing equally poor. I mean, about nine nine percent eight percent population reduction um, per year over several years. Found that one in, in their, this case, let's say Murders Creek was at 11.1% body fat, Klamath Basin is 7.6%. Again, this could indicate predation problem in Murders Creek, Klamath Basin, we've got a habitat issue. And this kind of leads directly into some of our first uh, issues and strategies here. Um, First is to develop a more comprehensive assessment of the degree predation is added or compensatory. Obviously, one of the big things we are going to be looking at is this research project to help guide some future management actions um, and, and, and looking at that uh, in a lot more detail. 
We also have uh, the collaring efforts that I mentioned earlier. We're going to continue monitoring those, look for changes over time by predator species and any emerging trends and mortality source um, to see, see how those uh, change through time to kind of give us an indication of areas that might warrant, uh, you know, further investigation or looking into deeper. <clears throat> Issue two, you know, it is preferable to use hunter harvest to manage predators in Oregon consistent with management objectives for mule deer as well as other ungulate species. Um, this, you know, it, it allows for opportunity for people to get out there and harvest these animals, and, and we certainly want to provide those opportunities. And, you know, we get a lot of questions, uh, you know, specifically related to, to, to Measure 18 that bound the use of, of cougar hunting and for, or sorry, hound hunting for cougars and black bears. And really since that time, we have liberalized a lot of seasons. You know, ODFW currently sells about 70,000 tags for bears and cougars, and, and we've done a lot of liberalization. Uh, we've lowered tag prices. Uh, Bear and cougar tags are included in the sports pack. We've increased season lengths, two tags for both species. A lot of quotas have been been increased. Uh, we do have a controlled spring and general season bear hunts now. And these liberalizations are in response to uh, a notable lower success rate for pursuing these species without the use of hounds and provides ODFW the greatest flexibility in managing predator species at a level consistent with other prey species, including mule deer. And we do think there is the potential to increase hunter participation in areas. And for instance, in 2022, we sold roughly 77,000 bear tags and 75,000 cougar tags, and we had a participation rate of only about 37% for our bear tags and 22% for our cougar tags. So there does appear to be a substantial opportunity for increased hunter participation and harvest indicating the use of hunters could indeed be a visible tool uh, under current circumstances. ODFW also maintains the ability to do active predator removal um, either through us or our agents. Um, most of those are going to be outlined in other management plans, specifically for cougars. Uh, the cri criteria are outlined in in our in our other management plans. And just I think uh, an example. I was just looking this up the other day. I think uh, units declining by 20% or more over the last five years, or are at that are at or below 60% of MOs for three years, can be considered for cougar target areas. And there's some other criteria within there. We have to maintain a certain percentage within each zone or population. Again, that's going to be zone and, and overall statewide dependent. But anyway, those are kind of some of the outlines. And if you want to read more, I would definitely refer to the, the cougar management plan. Um, as far as coyotes, they can be hunted year round with no bag limits right now. Um, any efforts to manage those through administrative removals would be coordinated with ODFW agents. Um, you know, I showed some of those graphs and figures, pie charts earlier. Mule deer predation from wolves right now does appear to be fairly limited, um, but any efforts, um, there, there is some language in our wolf management and the Oregon Wolf Conservation and Management Plan that does allow, um, you know, to mitigate some of the impacts of wolves, but that would be dictated by the, by the, the, the management plan, as well as the status, both whether it's federally or state listed, in that area. And we are going to be uh, moving into that northeast herd range, kind of the, you know, that Mount Emily and, and Sled Springs area uh, in 2024 for our, our continued monitoring efforts. Uh, this is the area of the state that has the highest wolf density, so we do hope to get a little bit better understanding of overall um, wolf mortality rates in some areas with a little bit higher wolf density. Uh, we do provide some guidance for future predator removal efforts um, and some times as as conducted by a lot of researchers on when those would be more most effective um, and kind of outline those in the chapter. Um, and additionally, we provide some strategy on improving monitoring efforts. Um, if you're going to do these target areas, I think, you know, it, we do need to have some increased monitoring and, and be able to gauge the effects more effectively. And, We've we've outlined several of those in the in the issues and strategies section of the plan as well. 
So kind of wrapping up, um, we do have four more sections, an anthropogenic poaching monitoring section, and Don alluded to these in his talk. We will be writing some herd range specific um, write-ups, and those will, will provide some management objectives. We really want to give some context on what these herd ranges are doing and how they've been performing over the last several years to provide some context for 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 those for those kind of changing metrics of going from wildlife management unit to the herd range structure. We will be revising all these chapters based on public feedback and then uh, hope to compile and, and kind of reformat these to make it a little bit more readable as opposed to just, you know, these individual sections. Um, once we get these last four sections done, we will do hopefully one last webinar in, in late November, potentially early December. And that would be kind of wrapping up the, the management plan. And again, I want to stress that we do consider these chapter, chapters that we are releasing as draft chapters. Um, feel free to comment on sections we presented on here tonight, both the harvest management or predation section, or any other sections that uh, that that you want. Um, we will be taking that feedback um, for quite some time. and. Um, we are we are looking at those comments as they come in and we'll revise the management plan accordingly. We do hope to get adoption hopefully in early 2024 and have a have a rough draft that is completed by late fall, early winter. And anyone interested that hasn't already done so can go to the uh, the Mule Deer Plan webpage. And with that, I think we can uh, transition into the question and answer session. Certainly can. Thank you, Don and Josh, for those presentations. Um, we'll now venture into our live Q&A session for the night. Uh, Mule deer management plan questions of all types are welcome, and, and we are recording your questions. Uh, I would like to thank all of you that have submitted questions leading up to tonight's webinar. That said, tonight's conversation will be focused on harvest management and predation. So getting started, I've got a question for the public for Don regarding antler point class restrictions. So the question is, why don't we manage some of the units for three points or better? Might this trophy create more trophy opportunities and higher quality bucks in some of the more sought after units in Oregon? Um, maybe what about just doing that every other year, which might increase like the likelihood of buck survival and also create more uh, opportunities for mature buck harvest. Um, so Don, with that question, and in your response, if you would, could you please describe what everybody's getting at when proposing these uh, point class restrictions, just to make sure that we're all familiar with that concept is? Yeah, thanks, Derek. That's a good question. It's a it's a question and comment or suggestion that we we hear a lot. Um, basically, I think the theory is is that if we restrict buck harvest to only animals that have a certain number of points on at least one of their antlers, say three point or four point or better. Um, the thinking is, is that will add more bucks and add more opportunity for a little bit larger, more mature buck. I think a lot of this is coming from the whitetail deer management world where that's pretty common and it tends to work okay in whitetail deer, but mule deer are not whitetail. Um, Almost every state in the West has tried some form of antler point restriction. Those that have tried it have all almost ubiquitously found that it doesn't work. Basically what it does is it tends to delay the harvest, the heavy harvest from younger bucks to two and three year old bucks. Over the long term, it does not result or none of the other states have ever found that it's resulted in higher buck ratios or a higher proportion of uh, larger antlered or high, higher number of points on these bucks. In fact, when it does occur, that tends to be pretty short lived and uh, it just doesn't work very well. So another question for you, Don, um, regarding management objectives. So one of the concerns is out there is that uh, is ODFW just lowering those MOs so they can actually achieve them? Uh, yes and no, both we, uh, mostly. Um, just to be honest, we are realistically lowering our population MOs or adjusting our population MOs 
to a closer range to what the actual populations are on the landscape. When the populations were originally set in 1981, they were set at a number that was pretty darn close to um, the perceived population size of mule deer on the landscape. But that landscape has changed, and what can realistically be expected for our landscape to support is much less than it was um, 10, 20, or 30 or 40 years ago. So we're doing two things. One, we're bringing them down to a realistic and achievable level um, so that it gives us actually more sensitivity in our efforts and monitoring of our efforts to improve those mule deer populations. So a little bit of both. So for you, Josh, um, obviously a lot of predator questions have been coming in uh, since this whole period started. Um, and so now here's the chance to kind of address some of that. So one of the common questions that comes up is why isn't ODFW doing predator removals, especially when predators might be the limiting factor? <laughs> well, I just kind of presented some of that data, uh, and a lot of other states have have basically shown they don't have as that much of an effect, and if they do, it's very short-lived, to be honest. Uh, they really need to be paired with some other other metrics. You need to improve your habitat quality. Uh, and again, I, I guess I just want to stress one thing, that I don't think anyone here at ODFW doesn't think that predators can affect mule deer populations. We do, in fact, recognize that predators can have an impact uh on on mule deer populations um but what we're seeing not only here in oregon but across the west is a kind of a range-wide decline in mule deer populations and that spans a lot of areas that have a variety of predator densities uh and, and predator components from prairie ecosystems where cougar populations are very low to you know mountain habitats um like you know the northeastern oregon so um there's there's a variety of things taking place there uh, that are going on, uh, but uh, you know again the short answer right now is is we haven't been implementing them because they just they really haven't shown much effect. So along those lines of of effects of predators and such, a lot of times we get questions about um, Measure 18 and the the prohibition on the use of hounds. Um, did the deer population start to decline? around the time of that ban using dogs for cougar hunting and when that went into effect? I'll borrow an answer from Don, yes and no. I mean, they continued to decline after that. <laughs> We've had a pretty pretty, pretty long scale and, and Don might be a better one. I mean, he's been our ungulate coordinator here for about 30 years now, yeah. but uh, I mean, those, those declines uh, have been taking place way before 1994, to be honest. Um, so we, we've seen a pretty slow and steady decline um, even even predating measure 18 um, and kind of you know related to that we we, we see several states uh, you know some of our neighboring states uh, I was just kind of scoping around Utah's website they've had some similar growth rates and and some similar uh, adult female survival that we do and you know they they also have hound hunting um, on the landscape there in Utah as well um, so I, I don't think we can tie all that back into to measure 18 and the banning of hound hunting. But uh, certainly, you know, hound hunting can be a useful tool in, in some, some areas to, to control predator populations. But I think there's other ways that we can, we can do that here in the state effectively as well. Yeah, so maybe you already kind of kept poking Don, so I'll go back to him. And if you would, Josh, uh, stop sharing your screen so we can see more of our big, ugly mugs. Um, uh, so Don, We've been talking a lot about these these landscape changes, especially when we had a conversation about our habitat um, habitat chapter. Um, so we keep mentioning that the landscape has changed significantly since the '90s. What has changed that has decreased habitat quality um, to support larger numbers of mule deer populations? That's actually really, really a good question, and and it's a lot of different things have changed. Uh, it was in the 1990s when 
drought cycles tended to become more prominent than normal or wet cycles. Um, that started to affect the vegetation on the habitat. That's when um, many of the changes to silvicultural practices started to be seen on our landscape as timber harvest started to drop about that time, less light started hitting the ground, less forage started becoming available for mule deer. Um, now in recent years, we're seeing more swings dramatic to the far extremes of those weather patterns from extreme dry to extreme and intense moisture and winter moisture. Along the same lines, we cannot ignore what we as people are doing to the Oregon landscape. Um, in September, we had the opportunity to do some tours in Central Oregon and in Deschutes County and the level of activity on the entire landscape there recreationally is huge. And that impacts our deer and other wildlife populations on there. So it's, it's kind of a two plus two plus two plus two. There are all of these things that are happening in Oregon and across the mule deer landscape are adding to each other and becoming this large, massive cumulative effect that's just slowly creeping everything downward. So sometimes we get those proposals though, of like, okay, if the, you know, uh, there's all these factors contributing and things, you know, people are concerned seem out of control. At times we get proposals of like, why not just halt harvest altogether? And, keep that in place for X number of years and try to allow populations to recover? Another good question. Um, and I think the answer to that is that our current mule deer populations are very at or very close to or at what the likely new capacity to hold mule deer is. If we stop with our active management on that, I think what would, would, we would likely see is increases in mortality rates or decreases in survival rates, because realistically, there's not enough room for them in the landscape. And that room could be everything from uh, enough forage and nutrition on the landscape to enough space on the landscape or enough open pathways for those animals to move between their desired winter and summer ranges if they're migratory animals. So I think the simplest answer is they're at what our current capacity is. What we need to do is continue our management, which is conservative from a harvest standpoint. We focus our harvest on bucks that have essentially zero or very little effect on population growth rate because of their reproductive strategy and we need to redirect and focus our effort on changing the capacity of the landscape to improve the number of mule deer numbers out there. So following along those lines of these changes over time we get a lot of questions and people tell stories about what they remember or when they were a kid or you know 40, 50, 60 years ago uh, they remember populations being at a certain level and a lot of questions come up of like, well, what's changed? And here you are describing some of the habitat changes, but what about the humans? What has there been in terms of a change in hunter numbers? Has that gone up? Has that gone down? And is there any relationship between any of those uh, occurrences? Like have we, we have so many hunters now that the pressure is so high, even having scaled back our, our tags? You know, are there any relationships there? Or what's, what's kind of the long-term narrative that a lot of people are thinking about when they look back throughout, honestly, their whole lifetime? Yeah, well, the narrative is is that um, Oregon and the hunting public in Oregon is not immune to uh, the changes that are seen nationally, where typically the number of hunters relative to the number of people in populations has declined over the last three or four decades. Um, I think in the last 10 or 12 years in Oregon, that decline hasn't been super dramatic, that the big declines have already occurred. We're kind of bouncing around up and down a little bit. The major reason for the decline in the number of mule deer hunters in Oregon, and my lights just went out, um, uh, the major reason for the decline as it, ex it exists now is Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife has responded 
to the changes in those mule deer population numbers to stay in a conservation framework in how we manage our harvest. So we've responded, as mule deer populations have come down, we've tried uh, everything in our book and we're looking for new tools in our toolbox now to try to change those mule deer numbers on the landscape, but we have to respond with our harvest management and we have to reduce our harvest levels on those populations as they've declined until we find the golden key to start fixing those mule deer populations. Thanks, Don. I appreciate that dive. Going back to you, Josh, talking about predation. So we get a lot of comments, a lot of concerns about, um, you know, the state reports, we've got 7,000 cougars across all age classes in Oregon. A cougar kills a deer every seven to 10 days. <clears throat> that math gets you over 300,000. Um, then you add on bears and wolves and coyotes and everything under the sun that likes to eat those tasty things. You know, that seems like kind of a very daunting, um, no good look that really creates a lot of fear and concerns from our public. What's what's your response to that? The, the, the first point of my talk was predation is complex. <laughs> and I want to reiterate that. When we start thinking about these concepts, it's important that that number that you put out, the 7,000 number, that is that also includes cubs and dependent young. So just bear in mind that. And you know, any anywhere from 30 to 40, 45 percent of a cougar population can be dependent young. So uh, you're realistically talking about you know close to half that, 3,500, 4,000 or something uh, cougars. And there's a couple of caveats. Again, this this is where the complexity comes in. We could have a whole talk on this, but. Uh, Th that number is correct, about one one animal ungulate per week. That's averaged out across females with cubs that are young, females with out cubs, uh, females with older age cubs. We know that as those cubs age, females with cubs tend to tend to kill more often. And again, so it's it's kind of averaged out. And we actually know males tend to kill a little bit less because they usually tend to take a little bit larger animals. For instance, they tend to tend to take elk in a larger percentage just due to their physical body size. They can take elk. A lot more often so you get populations that are structured differently um, can take a different component of the the, the prey population the prey base um, but also when we think about that number uh, we're not only talking about mule deer we're talking about whitetail and bighorn sheep and and elk and a lot of other species are on the landscape so that's not just 300,000 deer a year it's it, it, you know it, it that that number is spread out uh, across the landscape and and again getting a little bit into the weeds here but those kill rates when we when we when we talk about that we do know for instance that the highest kill rate is just after that ungulate birth pulse so we know that that cougars for instance kill a lot more elk right after they take a lot of those those newborn elk calves they take a lot of those newborn mule deer fawns so that tends to increase that overall kill rate too on the landscape and those 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 segments of the population uh, tend to be a lot more compensatory mortality because a lot of those are we're going to die anyway so um, again it, it's complex and and it takes getting into the weeds on thanks josh i'll be mindful we probably got about maybe five minutes or so left we're already you know in our 90 minute presentation um, so maybe I'll, I'll hit one back to Don and and so it comes to population management, uh, concerns of mule deer populations. We know females are such an important critical component to populations and their trajectories. So why do we even consider uh, doe harvest when populations are so low? I mean, can't that just make things worse? I, a lot of folks just can't see any value to that whatsoever. Good question. And it's it's worth looking at. Um, and this is another yes and no answer. In some situations, it really can make things worse because a mule deer population is incredibly sensitive to mule deer mortality rates. If 20 out of every 100 mule deer die every year, that population is going to be stable or likely declining. If only 10 out of every 100 does die every year, that population is probably going to be going up. 
Um, it's all dependent on lots of things. One of the things that we have seen over the years in Oregon and across the West is without harvest on females, sometimes those the age structure of that population can get really, really old. Uh, that can affect production and reproduction and survival. But as stated in the, the issues and strategies, it's worth looking at both the mortality patterns in the population, whether they're additive or compensatory, as Josh described, and how far away from the landscape capacity we think that population might be. It's very well that if we have populations that are at that landscape capacity and all of our information says that the mortality that's going on in that is more compensatory than additive from a harvest standpoint, we could potentially evaluate limited, uh, tightly controlled female harvest to perhaps help with the age structure of that population and in some cases the, the sex structure of that population. Thanks, Don. I know it's kind of a complicated topic, uh, but I think it's important for everybody to start hearing some of this and how these conversations recognize that there's, it's very rarely black and white. I know you like your yes and no answers because that's just complex. That's the, that's it. If it were easy, we wouldn't have a job. Um, so looking at the clock, we need to start wrapping things up. Um, Josh, I wanted to give you a chance to, to have any last kind of final thoughts or ideal take home messages that you'd like for everybody. Um, maybe regarding these chapters or how they've connected to everything or even get a pitch for the, the next go round. I'll let Don think about it when, while you're responding. <laughs> well, I just, first off, I guess, thank, thanks everybody for, for tuning in um, and, and watching the webinar. Um, despite some technical difficulties there, we'll, 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 we'll manage to get through this. But again, I just want to go back to my opening. I, these topics, especially the predation section, when we start talking about that, it is complex. It is controversial. We do have a lot of different segments of, of the population that, that value predator and prey species differently. And that does that does create, you know, some some balance that we have to strive to to find within. But certainly from a, a wildlife management agency, we are looking to manage all species at, at, at an effective level. And we, we we try to strive to find that balance between both predator and prey species on the landscape and uh, and and try to strike that balance and and hopefully as folks read the chapter and digest the information that we presented in there uh, I think we 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 hope to make that clear and that we we do care about this resource and are going to do uh, whatever it takes uh, to to kind of ensure their their long-term viability and ensure they're there for future generations so my that's my pitch Thanks, Don. Or thanks, Josh. You, Don? Yeah, I'll just kind of um, lead right off of what Josh says. You know, we care and we're paying attention and we care enough that over the last 20 plus years or so, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife has invested an immense amount of money, an immense amount of time, and an immense amount of brain power trying to develop and understand the absolute best science and data and information that we can use to manage our mule deer. We look at what we've done here in Oregon. We look at what all of our colleagues in the West do. Uh, I've been on the mule deer group, working group Westwide for 15 years. Josh is attending those meetings as well. We're paying attention, we're learning, we're experimenting, and we're using the best that we can find to help inform our management direction. And hopefully a lot of that's gonna show up in these sections and chapters of this management plan to, to keep us on track and do good things and hopefully improve mule deer. Great, well said. Well, thank you staff and everybody for watching. Uh, we generally value your participation in this effort to update the Oregon Mule Deer Management Plan. And we all look forward to additional engagement. So stay tuned for additional chapters to be set to be released in the coming weeks that will cover anthropogenic, poaching, monitoring, and herd range information and objectives. The corresponding webinar will on the topics will likely occur sometime in late November. Finally, as stated earlier, questions and comments are welcome at any point throughout this lengthy process and can be submitted via the link in the YouTube description below. 
Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your evening. Good night. Thanks.